Welcome, everybody. I feel the light is changing. It seems like it's time to start. Yeah. Welcome. Um, this session uh, will be by Brandon Rehek about data protection. What do we actually need to protect when we talk about data protection? Um, are we understanding it correctly currently? The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks for you to come here to listen to what does data protection actually protect. Uh, the subtitle is why we have to stop talking about individual privacy and more talk about social sustainability. Um, maybe first I say something about myself so you know who's talking and from which perspective. Uh, I'm a research associate uh, at the Weizmann Institute for the Network Society. Um, I'm a doctoral candidate and researcher there, and I'm doing research on uh, digitalization and sustainability, tech fictions, data protection, and, uh, well, um, unsurprisingly, and IT security. Um, my background is computer science and philosophy at Humboldt University and Free University, and I'm also active in the forum Computer Scientists for Peace and Social Responsibility, uh, the Society for, Com for Computer Science uh, in the Ethics uh, part, and uh, with Amnesty International Germany, uh, Human Rights in the Digital Age. Okay, so what are we going to talk about and why? First, I want to talk about some basic terms because um, I noticed that when we talk about data protection, it's usually a lot of things come together and a lot of people understand different things, which I think is okay that this happens, but we should be aware of the differences to have a fruitful discussion, especially when, you merge, when we merge it with a concept of social sustainability. Um, then I will come into a problem description. So what does data protection actually try to solve or address? Then some examples about data protection theory to uh, like deepen our understanding and practice. And then I want to talk about some uh, smoke screens and non-solutions that are usually posed as solution to the data protection problem, as I would like to call it. Um, then I want to compare it or like merge it somehow with the social sustainability briefly as a starting point for discussion. Uh, then there will be some references and then we can exchange um, um, our ideas uh, towards what I've been saying now. So, some basic terms. Uh, first, I would like to differentiate data protection, data protection law and data security. Data protection itself is a social science term because it's about um, society, it's about humans, it's about protection of things that are not technical. Then we have data protection law which is when we talk about GDPR or other regulations, which is the legal form of data protection. And then we have data security, which is informatics or computer science term. This is usually how you, we will get into this a bit uh, more in, in, in a second, um, how to actually deal with the data and the data processing itself. The interesting thing here is that each of them have their own rules of discourse. What is being protected? Wh how, how, what are the measurements and the tools being used? Um, and sometimes they don't even agree on, on what, what they're about. That's why we talk about this. Um, and that's, that's, that's very interesting because the problem description always defines the solution. It defines the solution space itself. And uh, then we talk about data all the time. I think it's also important to somehow shed some light onto the meaning of data and inf information. Okay, first, data protection law. We see it protects individuals and groups, the purpose, um, th this is the purpose, and um, the protection object is personal data. This is the first interesting thing here. We want to protect individuals and people, and we do it by protecting personal data. There's a difference here, which is, in a, in a way, you could say um, tax laws should maybe protect uh, people with less income, but we look at money. There are many other ways of achieving this, but the, but the thing we look at when in, in data protection law is personal data. Of course, we could also say, are there other ways of reaching the same goal if, if we maybe regulate other things? Especially uh, if we talk about law, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, um, uh, valid all across uh, uh, Europe, um, implements Article 8 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, especially I would like to underline Article 1. Um, <laughs> human dignity is uh, inviolable um, and it must be respected and protected, and Article 8, uh, the protection of personal data. And you could say, um, any processing of personal data by an organization constitute an interference with fundamental rights of a data subject, because 
you're interfering with a person if you do some data processing that affects them. That's why it's called the data subject, the subject of the data being processed. Um, in data protection law, we have certain principles in the GDPR, which is lawfulness, fairness, transparency, purpose limitation, data minimization, accuracy, storage limitation, integrity, confidentiality, and accountability. What I find interesting is that we have a big data protection discussion that we should regulate more some of those aspects, while at the same time, they are already being regulated in the GDPR principles, but that seems to be forgotten all the time. For example, a look at the big discussion about fairness currently. Fairness is explicitly one of the GDPR principles, but now sometimes or, or oftentimes um, it seems like fairness is a new invention since the upcome of AI, but fairness is a principle in all data processing, and which is, which is of course uh, quite logical because um, I can infringe and discriminate people without AI. You know, that's not a new problem. Maybe, maybe there's a new um, quantity coming up, but uh, then the question would be how to adapt what we already know to the new situation maybe with, with uh, machine learning. And the lawfulness of processing and data protection law would be consent, contract compliance. I don't go into details there, but consent is kind of the, the, the individual a willingness to, to let data being processed. Contract is if I want certain service and the necessary data protection, then uh, the necessary data um, processing then is legal, compliance with law, for example, for archiving, vital interests, for example, if it's a life and death situation, then it's always legal, according to the GDPR, to process any, any information to protect the person, um, public interest and legitimate interests. Legitimate interest is a very interesting uh, point here, but I don't want to go deep. This would be a different talk. Um, legitimate interest is uh, the cause of many problems we have right now, but uh, this is not the topic here. Okay, the next thing is data security or IT security. The classic protection goals of data security are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So you can somehow, from a technical point of perspective, you could say it's the permissions to read, write, and execute. If I say who can read it and who can't, then I'm controlling confidentiality. If I say who can change and write onto the data, then it's about integrity. And if we talk about execution, this is kind of, uh, you know, the, uh, flexible, but uh, it's if, if the service or the data is available to me. And a violation in data security would be if one of those three um, are violated. So if people can access this who should not, people who can change it who should not, or people um, sh can have access to a, a service they should not, or people who should be able to access it cannot. And those three are somehow differentiated because if I destroy a computer, I'm certainly not violating the confidentiality, but I'm certainly violating the integrity of it. That's why we differentiate this. Interesting here is that data security in its pure form secures the data processing and the existing data itself for the, for the processor itself. We will see later on why this is important. Um, and in Germany, it, could, uh, it should be mentioned that since 2008, uh, there is a fundamental, uh, fundamental right uh, for individuals to have uh, the guarantee of confidentiality, of integrity, uh, and confidentiality and in integrity um, of the systems they use. Um, I like to call it the fundamental right to cyborg, uh, because in the explanation, uh, the German Constitutional Court said that we are so dependent on such systems that we have the right to uh, confidentiality and integrity being agreed, uh, uh, um, yeah, guaranteed, which I find quite interesting. So how about we now we talked about data protection law and um, about uh, uh, IT security or data security, but how about data protection itself? Well, I want to give a little background first on society, why, which is, which is uh, important, just a, a brief little sprinkle. Right now we live in a society based on division of labor. It's a, it's a world with a multitude of actors and those actors have different roles in our society. And there are power asymmetries between individuals and an organization. Um, what do I mean by this uh, society based on division of labor? This means that not all of us 
are experts in all other areas. Most of the time we are at least expert in one area and we are lay people in all other areas. So we are very dependent on each other. And why is that, why is that uh, relevant? Well, if I say, well, let's, um, you know, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's suggest a certain solution which is very technical, then this solution applies only to the people who can actually operate them. To ask a certain solution, like, you know, you should encrypt your stuff or you should, you know, do all those things. Um, this means we all have to educate ourselves there, which as a, as a person with a technological background, I like. But, of course, people who are more into, let's say, food regulation would say exactly the same. And purple, people who are more into, let's say, train safety would maybe say the same. But uh, in the society based on division of labor, we found means to say, well, maybe there should be minimum standards. So we can access a train or we can drive a car. Okay, with car, we need a driver's license, but still. Or we can go into a supermarket and not get killed by the wrong decisions or not get big harm with the wrong decisions. Um, and now, if we look at uh, the power asymmetries, of course, um, there's a difference between an individual and organization. Organization can be a state, can be a, an, a, like a, a business, but it could also be an NGO. Um, and usually those organizations have much more means and have much more um, options um, to assert their own interests um, in a social relationship. And this is the definition, at least for Max Weber, for power as a chance to do exactly that, even against opposition. You can differentiate this to enforce a certain action, you can prevent a certain action, or you have the power to define a certain discourse, how we talk about things. Um, and now, when we take this background of a, um, of a uh, society with a division of labor, um, into this world of computerization, we see we have computers everywhere, nearly ubiquitous computerization and the digitalization, which we now call, the process we now call digitalization has been going on for around fi 50 years, you could say. And we have computer-supported information processing of organizations, governments, businesses, NGOs, as I mentioned before, exactly those organizations who, in principle, um, have more power already than an individual. And in addition, you could say there's also no individual uh, decision anymore to participate in this kind of computerization or not. Even if you would like to work on paper, at a certain point you will, if you do your taxes or if you buy a ticket or some, you know, all those, all those things, if you get money from the pension fund or you pay into the pension fund, of course, all of this is digitized. So to say um, I do a little detox tour might feel really nice and might be really healthy, but it doesn't help, doesn't help you in any way to escape the computerization process in, in a society. So, of course, the solution to this individuals and organizations using um, computerization and software to, to organize lives and processes, uh, the solution to escape this cannot be going back to the caves. Um, but... Uh, cannot be back to the caves, uh, but what could be the solution? How, so how do we deal with all those power asymmetries that are now, now tech, technologicalized, you could say, or, or informationalized? And this, I would say, um, this is the question that data protection tries to, to answer. What do we do with all this power and all those asymmetries that cannot be resolved in principle because organizations are always more powerful than the individual? Okay, now we've been talking about the data, Interesting thing is that the data in data protection means information as a model for a certain purpose. This means that when we talk about raw data, that's already an oxymoron. There is no raw da data because all data um, is made for a certain purpose and it has all the models like included in itself and for a certain purpose. And now you can ask whose purpose is it? And now we see if organizations write software and collect data, it is, of course, their interests being represented in how the data model itself is already created. And this is even before the first actual data is being collected. The model itself represents the purpose of the organization. And, of course, the purpose is very reduced because I have to... If I want to do computation, I have to reduce the complexity of the world into a model. And it's subjective. It is 
it is, what I want to achieve with my system, what, how I built the system. Um, okay, yeah, we could go into semiotics, but I think uh, because of time we skip this a little bit. Um, okay, so maybe to, to, to sum this part up a little bit, technology, especially IT, helps organizations and individuals to better assert their own interests, and IT creates information power affecting the fundamental rights of individuals because of the big asymmetries between the different players. If I program a, a piece of software, that's of course not the same thing when Facebook writes certain software because the amount of users, the amount of funds I have, um, all in it shows that there's a big structural difference. Um, and of course, we don't want to go into caves, but uh, we want to have all the good things that come with the digitization. Uh, the processing is desirable, um, but um, we have to pay attention to the power asymmetries. And yeah, okay, we come to this point later. Okay, so the data protection problem can be rephrased as information processes must not bring about socially and societally harmful consequences. So what we want is the good things and the implications without getting the bad things. So of course the question is what is the good thing and what are the bad things to prevent? And uh, the researcher Martin Rost also said um, data protection also means maintaining alternatives of the weaker party. And of course the weaker party is if I, if I look at the relationship between me and, for example, the German state when I apply for something, of course, the alternatives, how, how does a system have to be designed so my alternatives later on are not reduced? How are the platforms designed so when I get in there, my alternatives are being reduced? We know this as lock-in effect, for example. And this is somehow interesting because it's analogous uh, to the sustainable development idea that the later generations should have the same opportunities uh, for accessing resources and having certain lifestyle uh, or a certain yeah, outlook on life. Um, this is somehow the, 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 the technological equivalent. And uh, as a consequence, what data protection says, we have to condition data processing. We have to say, those are rules, those are red lines, uh, though this area is totally fine. But uh, here's, uh, you know, this, this should not be done. Or, or if you do it, you have to do it in a certain way. So what we want, we don't want natural development because natural development means the rule of the strongest. So we want all those computation, but we have to think about the rules, um, how that applies. And in a certain way, uh, so we say data protection, of course, does not protect data. That's a misnomer. Um, but individuals and society as a whole society as a whole, you could say functional differentiation, you could say certain uh, group rights, I don't know, right to assemble, or even that um, the um, knowledge creation or the creation of an opinion in societies that all this works, this is far beyond the individual. Um, but this is only partially reflected in law. And now we see that there's a difference between the data protection, as I just l outlined it, and data protection law. Because data protection law, GDPR says it protects the fundamental rights and freedoms, and it protects fairness, which is much more, that w much more as we see in the discussion, in the political discussion, but it's much less what we actually want when we talk about data protection. We heard this at the opening ceremony already. We, talk, we say data protection should protect society, and we hear this, but this is currently not re uh, reflected uh, in the law. Um, but I would already be happy if we would already impose and, and, um, and use the law we have, which we still do not uh, when we listen to those fairness discussions as if it would be and something new. Okay, but of course, but what are, the, what are the motives for less data protection? Well, of course, data protection needs additional resources for the people who do the data processing. Most of the time, the organizations. You need more people, you need knowledge, you need to conceptualize, you need to think. Not only I want to, you know, connect those people, I want to maybe bring those items there, I, don't, I want to have, you know, smart mobility, but you have to think, the whole data processing, how do I achieve it? And there are actually solutions to, to a lot of problems we see out there, but they have to appro be approached in a different way. Um, and not easily in the, at the first sight and you implement uh, this. So this is nothing one can do afterwards when, when the system is already there. So that's why 
the, the, the main idea or the main impetus of data protection has to be it's part of the core design principles from the beginning on. Especially because, and that's what I mentioned before, because of the modeling of the processing of the data and all this. Um, and of course, data protection pre prevents the use of information or business models. This can be a good thing or a bad thing. Again, there's a discussion about this. Um, but of course, I think uh, we agree that certain data processing is needed for public or official tasks. Um, but of course, the discussion is, you know, how should this look like and what are the implications? How can we do this without being socially harm harmful? Um, and the interesting thing is that especially in IT, we are a little bit behind with the regulation, it seems to me, because we get discuss about certain things we would never discuss in the areas of hygiene rules or safety regulations, uh, prohibition of child labor, workers' rights, environmental standards, etc. Environmental standards, of course, all, the, all this can be improved. But um, to say... Yeah, okay, I will, I will come to this in, in a bit. Uh, hygiene rules, where there are straight red lines, what's impossible to do? because uh, we have a common understanding of harm. Okay, yeah, this is it. Okay, maybe some data protection theory as a, as a finishing, um, or if, yeah, somehow finishing. Um, if we look, this is somehow now getting it a bit uh, deeper into the, um, into the differentiation I wanted to make. Um, if we look at information flow between certain actors, for example, an organization and an individual, as we mentioned before. Or the organization is the strong one and the individual is the weak one, as we mentioned before. If we have the direction of flow of information from the strong to the weak and we increase this, that means we call this, uh, this, we call this transparency or freedom of information. If we block this information flow from the strong actor to the weak one, we call this arcane practice or the hidden practice. If the direction of flow is from the weak to the strong, if we increase this, we call this datafication. And if we block this, we call this data protection. So here this explains now um, why, for example, in Germany we have a, a federal commissioner of information freedom and data protection. Where usually would think, well, the first one is actually restricting information, the other one is actually spreading information. But it makes total sense when we look at it with the, with the glasses of power asymmetry. Because the transparency weakens the strong and the data protection strengthens the weak. And that's why it makes total sense to bring this together and to have this um, in our data protection concepts. And of course we see if we have more like restrictive authoritarian uh, regimes, we have datafication of everything while at the same time the state or other, um, other um, um, businesses don't say what they do. We have arcane practice and datafication at the same time. Okay. So, to finish, sooner or later, no, I will go into this. Uh, some mentions to the smoke screens and non-solutions. So, now we saw data protection is about power asymmetries. So, we hear a lot about digital self-defense, uh, you know, encrypt your emails and, uh, you know, update your, your things. I totally agree, but we have to see the societal dimension of this. If data protection, the idea of data protection is to protect the weaker ones, against the organizations to say digital self-defense is somehow cynical to say you are the weaker one and it's your task to defend yourself. You have to become an IT expert and while doing this you still can't change the inner organizational data processing. So you can encrypt your emails but if you have to uh, inter interact with, the, with financial institutions of course there's nothing to, to encrypt. So digital self-defense is interesting for people who know their stuff uh, and who live maybe alone, not, not connected with the rest of society, but it is not a societal solution to the data protection problem. Data ownership, in a individual data sovereignty. If I have property rights and inclusive rights about data, then where's the, we would create, we look at it from a perspective of power asymmetries, we create a much bigger problem than we can actually solve because now if we say data ownership, I can own my data, that means I can sell my data. So I put out a TV and say, well, this TV's price is this and that, and it's half price if we get all your data. It's ownership, so you can freely sell your data or you don't sell your data, but now we can see in the societal background what would happen. People who have a lot of money can use the data ownership to get the, the protection they want, and people who are not so financially well off, 
they will get exploited. But wasn't exactly this problem what we wanted to solve with data ownership? Well, it doesn't work. Exactly, that's why it doesn't work. Consent fetish. Um, okay, I, I'll get this. And uh, data trust. Okay, we have maybe a, a bit more. Okay, maybe some 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 sentence to the consent fetish, uh, as I would like to call it. Um, as we saw. Um, this understanding, I think, which is very useful about data protection, would be a societal-wide uh, um, um, uh, concept. But if we focus on informational self-determination, that people by themselves can decide this, we get somehow in the same problem as with data ownership. Um, but informational self-determination si sounds much more empowering. And of course, this is why... Um, a lot of, uh, um, especially the, the, the bigger businesses say, well, actually, the problem of informational self-determination is a problem of information asymmetry. If the people would know more, they could decide better. But of course, we all know, uh, and as studies have said, if we would read all the uh, data privileges of all the services we need, we would use six weeks each year only reading this. Of course, that's, that cannot be a solution. The problem is not information asymmetry, but power asymmetry. Um, okay, so the only reason, uh, the, the only solution to this would be somehow hard limits for data protection. And the best case is, not the best case, but the, the, thing, the, the idea data protection would aim for with the democratic legitimization. Uh, legitimization. Um, same goes for algorithm ethics. We talk about algorithm ethics, we need ethical algorithms. But of course, the algorithms are not actors. The organizations are actors. They use the algorithms to further their interests. So to say we have to look at the algorithms somehow leaves out that there are actually actors using this. And we, had, we have mentioned this at the beginning. Who makes the systems? Who creates the data uh, uh, models? Who plans uh, and, and puts the purpose? It's not the algorithm. The algorithm is a tool. And of course, the tool can be regulated, but it's, the tool is not part of an ethical discussion. Um, Okay, so I would say our ethics are fine, uh, just the implementation of law lags behind and the discussion uh, what we do with new actors like big tech companies. But this is, of course, the, the place here uh, to do this. Okay. So, and um, algorithm ethics, of course. Um, I think now that we look at all those things, uh, all, all those like uh, the smoke screens, I think it makes total sense for a corporation who does not want regulation to say, oh, we need data ownership to empower the people, um, uh, uh, individual self-determination, this is the most important thing, and we also have to be very ethical, and with everything we do, we will be very transparent. Of course, I would also make all those four points, because none of those four points actually help the purpose of data protection. Okay, comparison, data protection forces organizations to consider the interests of data subjects when designing their data processing. It's against their interest. Huh? That's uh, interesting. Uh, the rights of a data subject is an obligation to the data controller. So every time when a company says, oh, that's so much paperwork, this means I'm not willing to make the effort to impose the protection of the people affected. And... Um, yeah, and now I think, at least how I understand it, we see that individual privacy, the idea of the, I go back into my living room, I don't want cameras in my home, this is a consequence of data protection and not the starting point. So if we have those power asymmetries taken care of, then we see it's actually not this camera in the, in the sleeping room, because if it's my own camera, then it's, of course it's a problem. It's no problem, because you know, there is no power asymmetry between me and myself. Um, but it's a problem you know, if, it's, if it's Echo or whatever it is. There is a company and the power asymmetries are so strong. So this individual privacy, we hear a lot being talked about um, in this understanding of data protection, would be a, resu a result. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think um, I would uh, finish with a very um, with an interesting 
um, citation uh, from uh, Martin Rost, because usually in computer science, when we talk about attackers and defense and IT security, we say Alice and Bob are communicating, and then is Mallory is attacking, and then they both encrypt and uh, and they both, you know, they they have to group together to fight off Mallory. And the citation or the the proverb was, if we talk about data protection, it's not Alice and Bob. Um, preventing or, or protecting against Mallory, but the attacker of Alice and Bob, in this case, is actually Bob. Bob is the attacker. And that's why we have to talk, look at Bob and not and attackers around, uh, but to those people who actually design the processing so it reaches uh, exactly uh, what we want um, as a society. Okay, that's it. Uh, maybe some uh, literature hints. Uh, you could take if you found this topic interesting, and then uh, I think we have time for some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm now running around the room taking questions. Please raise your hand if you have any. And wave. All cleared. Very, very clear. Um, I guess I have a question. Um, we often also see that data, I think this is the, the, the point about Bob, right? So my data can actually also not only harm myself, but actually harm you if it's in some way used to, um, uh, to make generalizations so that you kind of fall out of the group of, of, of normalcy or, and, and, so on, and so on and so forth. Um, would that also fit into that? Can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on how you see that? Um, I think it's, this is an important point too. Um, I would first look at, uh, of course, l the data processing could harm the individual, but it could, of course, uh, harm other people. I think um, maybe I would extend your question even to say it is impossible to have data processing that does not affect other people. Uh, the, the classic example, of course, is uh, we have our email providers and uh, we uh, sign up for them and then we say, yeah, we've read the privacy agreement. And then this is the reason because we have agreed. But of course, with this process, we have agreed for everyone who's writing us an email as well. So if we take the network society seriously, it's, we can say it's a good or a bad thing at the same time, but the network society means we are connected all the time, and that's why I, I would agree uh, that this has to be taken into consideration, and that's why we need those kind of, let's say, regulations or, or um, uh, the red lines collectively, and the system we have right now somehow the, to de determine this is a political system with democratic legitimacy. And I think that's why it's so important to also fight against lobbyism and all this, because this is kind of the, the self-realization of a society, what, what it wants. Um, because, yeah, I agree, this, this is, uh, it's all instantiations of the same problem, that no decision only affects yourself. And um, yeah, that's, that's the example with the going back to the cave. If, if we go back to the cave, then maybe it's only the family that's affected. But uh, this is not the case anymore. And it's also nice. I mean, it's also to be in a nice community. And this is a wonderful thing, but that's why, um, yeah, so in, the, in a way I would agree to this question and uh, refer to the approach I outlined. Thank you. Um, can I now take a question from the audience? Somebody? Ah, yeah, okay. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question um, that is uh, some cities or some public actors, especially in France, start some projects called self-data projects, which mean that they uh, implement platforms where you can basically see very easily what the public actors or what of your data were given to the public actors or what you, what you gave uh, during uh, making demands or processes. Um, so that, would that enter your self-determination 
Um, definition or would it be, you think, a good kind of solution to also take control back on what data public or private actors, if it's implemented by private actors, really has on you and that you can then decide very easily to um, implement your rights your, that is in the law to, okay, I don't want that you have this data anymore, you can cancel it. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. I think this is a, this is a quite good example. Um, in principle, I think it's a really good idea uh, to have those kind of, I think they're called cockpits or transparency or, and, and, and information um, yeah, central points. But it gets all the good and the bad things about the transparency. The good things are I can see what's happening and I can see how the data is processed. But the bad thing is how, how can I really exercise this right? How much time do I have? How often can I do it? Can everyone do it? Is it accessible? And if I, um, if I want to contradict, what can I do? Like, what is if, if I say, okay, now I see something, but I'm not happy about it, does those platforms also al allow me to say, actually, I don't want this usage. I want to break this connection, and I want to, you know, uh, object to this. So if it's only... Uh, if it's only an information platform, then I would be very critical of it. And I would think, okay, this is again uh, to to wash away the problem of the power asymmetry. Uh, to a, it's only a problem of information. If you would know everything, then everything would fine. It uh, would be fine. And um, yeah, and that's why I would say the, my basic question back would, would then be: so how much can you intervene? How, and how how much do also data protection regulatory authorities? Can they mass check those settings or the, the usage? Can they, in maybe even in an automatic way, can this transparency also use, be used in a systematic way to check um, um, overreaching activities? So is it only pointed to the individual to check? Or is it also, has it also APIs or whatever um, that, uh, yeah, that data protection authorities could, could use this in a way? So I think then I would differentiate this. Um, yeah, also thanks for the talk from me. Um, I have the feeling that discussion around data protection are always filled with memes, like data protection makes everything more um, hard for businesses and so on. Do you have examples um, from um, successful, from our point of view, discussion around the topic of data protection and what can we learn of them from your point of view? Um, yeah, that's actually, uh, th that's, that's a pretty good point. Mm, well, I think the, the problem, and that's why I tried to, uh, I decided to make this talk, is that um, data protection usually is a scapegoat for saying something with the IT doesn't work according to what I want. I, you know, uh, I can't access this or that data. Yeah, it's because of data protection. Or um, so, I think the first step is uh, to to make this clearer. All those concepts, and well, things that. Um, worked well, I think it, it does not really make sense to always stay in the abstract area. I think if, if people say, oh, actually, data protection was bad for this or good for this, okay, let's get examples for that. What were, like, how much, how much more effort do you have and what are the results? And there are, I don't know, there, there are examples of, of uh, public software um, uses where... Um, Maybe the design was inclusive, and then we have to get more into the, the concrete examples to get away from the memes, because otherwise it just stays a conversation. Um, and my, my impression is that in a lot of situations uh, where the data protection uh, is said to be a, a blocking for, for businesses or even for public uh, use, if we look deeper into it, we see the problem is not data protection. Because data protection says, well, if you have a certain purpose and the purpose is according to our values, then uh, you, you can do it. And um, so if there's a big problem, then probably there's something wrong with your purpose. And, but, but this has to be, yeah, so a concrete example. Let me think uh, about it. Um, yeah, that's, there are some, some bigger and smaller. Um, well, let's say I think uh, th there have been some, let's say, Digital strategy. Now, okay, that's a that's a complex example to explain why this is a good example. 
Um, okay, then my answer, I would reduce my answer to say um, we have to uh, we have to look at the at the um, um, the concrete processing if 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 someone says okay this is a big uh, this is a big issue. It's um, I know it's a very un un unsatisfying answer, um, but um, yeah I think this is uh, I, I would l leave it at that as for now. Okay, we have one minute left and one question left. So. Uh, thanks um, for the talk. Um, my question uh, kind of goes back to the Alice and Bob situation. So Bob is the untrusted actor there. So what is it? Is it a practical? Is it practical to, for example, Alice encrypts homomorphically their data before they give it to Bob? So it's only meaningful to Alice, but Bob can still do some meaningful operations without actually knowing or getting any meaningful. Um, is it practical or? Mm -hmm. um, um, that's a very good and very detailed, interesting question. Um, and if we take data protection seriously. Uh, there is no clear answer to this uh, very common question because the question would be from a data protection point of view in which situation is this being used? How are the actors related with each other? Do they share the same interest? What are the dangers if the, the encryption does not work? Or what are the dangers of the results of this analysis? Because if the results of the analysis can still be discriminating against the person um, or another group of people, then it would not... Uh, um, it would not help to have this uh, uh, this homomorphic encryption. So that's why it has to be decided from case to case. You can. There are situations where it's a good idea to encrypt, but there's also a, a good situation. You know, if I encrypt all the data from the pension funds, <laughs> you know, that's bad for everyone because they cannot be read, and you don't get your pension. So th that's what I'm. Uh, that's why I'm saying it. You can't say let's encrypt it, and that's why it's good. And maybe one one last uh, comment to the question. Um, I just it just came to my mind um, the way how the Linux distribution Debian reaches their technical design goals is I think a very good way of of doing this uh, looking at uh, how data protection can be taken seriously how there's a democratic process how there's a discussion how there's a technical deep analysis of what should be done and that would what would happen there and then uh, how the technology in the end looks like is a result of this whole inclusive process. There are many problems with this example, but I didn't want to leave you, you know, with totally no example at all. Um, and it's a partly technological example only, so that's why I think it's a good example. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank also you. thank you, the audience, and see you around in another session.